Well, hey there. My name is Greg Holmes. I'm one of the pastors here at Chase Oaks Church, and uh, we wanted to do a, uh, a podcast discussion here to talk about uh, just kind of a cultural issue and something we want to want to grapple with. And the reason we're doing this is uh, we're we're in the middle of a series called Jack, Jill, and the Hill. And in this series, we're talking about a whole host of things: uh, masculinity and femininity, and uh, and sex and dating and marriage. And and as we were planning this series. Uh, it was clear that there were a lot of topics uh, that we would like to talk about then just but are not able to for the sake of time and those types of things. But there were a few topics that we really wanted to um, make sure we grappled with. And, and, and one of those topics is a topic that uh, we're going to talk about here today with these two gentlemen, and that is um, what transgender or what... Um, what gender dysphoria or, and we're going to even talk about some of those terms. Yeah, I even trip over those terms and what those mean. Um, we're going to talk about our transgendered um, friends and family and, 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 uh, and co-workers and, uh, and just learn a little bit more about how we should respond and how we need to be Christ Church in that conversation. And let me just say also that in this conversation, uh, my goal is not to kind of settle the issue once for all because this is uh, a tricky topic and these are um, just tricky things that we're talking about and good people disagree. But I do uh, want for us uh, as a church and as a Christian community to um, just think well about these things and to love well uh, when it comes to these issues. And so for this conversation, I've invited two people to join us. And to my left is Lee Tran. And Lee is a certified uh, professional counselor. He's also the pastor of counseling and care here at Chase Oaks Church. Uh, and then to my right is Dr. Gary Barnes. And um, Dr. Barnes is a licensed psychologist, a, a certified sex therapist, and a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I could think of no one better to bring in on this topic uh, to talk, and my hope is to get them talking and then get out of their way. Um, but first, and some of this is for, for my sake, but also for the sake of those who are listening, um, maybe, Dr. Barnes, if you could just help, just sort of clarify some of the terms. I was tripping over some of those terms just a minute ago about uh, transgendered or gender dysphoria or gender identity, and, and there's also the acronym of um, LGBT, and we're really kind of talking about the T in that, but how does transgender relate to sexuality? Is it is it sexual, you know, like all of this, help us sort of clarify what we're talking about and what terms we should be using and, and that. Yeah, so uh, first of all, just thanks so much for this opportunity. This is really wonderful mm -hmm. to have some conversation about this to to uh, help us think well and, and love well. I think mm -hmm. that's an awesome phrase that you gave us. So uh, in order to help that process, you know, our understanding and especially our use of words will, will be foundational, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, it's also common currently that some of the same words can be used with different definitions. And so it's a good starting point to have. You know, uh, one of the things you asked about was, um, is there something distinct about the T in LGBTQ right. and on? Right. So, and, and that is definitely uh, a yes answer to right. that. And so, although there may be some things that we would see as some similarities. Um, so for a transgender person, that's very uh, much a broad term that's even referred to as an umbrella term. And there's many subterms that could fit under that. But things related to transgender are distinct from things related to sexuality. And especially sexual identity and gender identity are distinct terms. And so when you say sexuality, that, would that mean like sexual attraction? Is that what you're meaning? Yes. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So a transgender uh, term could be used independent of whatever a person's sexual attractions are. Okay. Okay. So is transgender the, the, in this conversation, is that the term we should be using or is it gender dysphoria? What is gender dysphoria? Okay. Sort of so that. let's even back up a few steps. Okay. Let's start with gender. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if we think about gender, this would be like the psychological, social, and cultural aspects of being male or female okay, okay so that's kind of a starting point reference 
then below that, we would have gender identity. And so uh, this would be how you experience yourself or think about yourself as male or female. So your identity is a self-label that you give about your maleness or your femaleness. Okay. Um, and then uh, when it gets to transgender, our umbrella term, uh, this is referring to uh, people who might experience or present or express their gender identities differently from their biological sex. Right. And so the expression of that then will be different than those who are expressing their gender in a way that's consistent with their biological sex. Okay. And so there could be a number of different expressions of that under the transgender umbrella. Okay. So for those um, who this may, that experience may sound just very, very foreign, you know, yeah. to feel that kind of dysphoria, I think there's some natural questions as to, like, is that something that culture sort of shapes into someone? Or is that something that people are choosing? And maybe maybe you have or don't have the answer to that. You know, like, what is there a cause to this, or is there? Um, I don't, I'm like, help me understand kind of what what brings that about, and you know. That. Yeah. yeah. There's, so there's lots of questions. I'm then. sure. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe yeah, start right. with the the question of cause, and because I think there's also prevalence questions in there, like if it's yes. changed at all in the in recent history. Right. But let's start maybe yes. with the cause. Yes. Yeah. Did you want to answer? That, no, please. please. <laughs> no, I defer to you, <laughs> Dr. Barnes. <laughs> okay. So, um, so our best understanding right now, the short, simple answer to that is we don't know. Okay. okay. We that's, don't know that's exactly. That's very helpful. Okay. <laughs> now, we do know a lot. Okay. We do know a lot. Um, like for biology, for instance, we know that in utero, the formation of a baby at the very beginning stage is the, uh, the genital organs are referred to as homologous. In other words, they're the same. Male and female. Male and female okay. mm -hmm. at the beginning stages. And it's the experience of testosterone in that normal developmental process that not only impacts the direction of male or female genitals, but also impacts the direction of male or female brain development. Okay. See, in normal development, we would say these two things track congruent with one another. But what we also know is that there are exceptions. There are incongruencies where the development of these two things are not congruent. Okay. And this is what ends up being the condition that's referred to as gender dysphoria. So it's the experience of the incongruence of my assigned gender the biology in terms of my genitalia with my psychological, emotional experience, my brain telling me I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Right. Okay. And then also it's important to realize this is experienced on a continuum. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not just all or nothing kind of a thing. Yeah, and one of the key elements of the 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 this dysphoria is the the amount of distress or discomfort a person feels as those two are divergent. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and that and I think it might be helpful to make the distinction between dysphoria in that in in as we describe it as a a level of discomfort um, and distress versus a disorder clinically. Yes, and so the, this is the change that's come in the understanding, but also in the classification. So. Our guide, mental health guide for classification of things as to whether they're a disorder or not a disorder, is the DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And in 2013, version five was released. And in this version, there's a new classification, a new category for dysphoria, gender dysphoria, rather than transgender disorder. Okay. See. 
And so in, in order for something to classify as a disorder, according to DSM, for a designated amount of time, depending on what the problem area is, there would have to be consistent distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other significant functioning in life. And so the understanding related to transgender dysphoria is that that's now distinct from a disorder. Okay. 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 It's also right. important to right. not uh, assign the definition of dysphoria as confusion. Okay. Yeah. Although that can also be present. That, that's really not that is helpful because I, I was assuming that, that those were synonymous but I guess not yeah let's yeah. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about why that's such an important distinction to make because uh, as you say that it tells me that uh, confusion implies there's a certain level of, of choice in figuring things out whereas dysphoria as you mentioned and uh, how you described it before there's a certain um, biological feature that that, uh, that happens behind that uh, something that happens in utero as you say so maybe um, talk around that a little bit that might be helpful yeah so um, the dysphoria is about the incongruence of mm -hmm. these two things my assigned gender and my expressed gender not being congruent with one mm -hmm. another and and that incongruence is not necessarily creating a confusion within me although I can have that but it it's that these things aren't congruent and mm -hmm. so I carry this okay, this, this is really a dysphoric condition mm -hmm. that I'm living in. So I could be very clear and not confused that there's an incongruence in my yes. body. Yes, that's right. a great so way of putting it. I'm not yeah. questioning it. Yeah. I know right. that there's, there's an incongruity. Gotcha. Yeah, right. that's helpful. So when you hear people talk about this, and when you hear, you know, especially you turn on the TV, you go to social media, like, there's pretty mm -hmm. strong opinions, and it's, pretty clear that people are coming at this from some, from different perspectives. Like some are seeing um, transgender as very much a, a moral issue. Some are seeing it as a diversity issue that we should celebrate. Like, mm -hmm. um, and I know, especially uh, Dr. Mark Yarhouse has written about some of these things. And Lee, uh, maybe you could sort of start like, what are some of those different lenses or different perspectives yeah. that we tend to bring into this that might help us Kind of as we as we process. Yeah, uh, um, I know Dr. Mark Garhouse and, and Dr. Gary Bonas have done a, a great deal of work behind this, and, and they've given us some pretty good uh, categories or lenses to look at this issue from. And I think those those lenses help us in the discussion. Um, and some of those lenses, I, as I understand it, the the integrity lens um, speaks to how we we see um, it through a lens of, of 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 a biblical perspective of male and femaleness, and that's that's fairly set and there's a there's almost as we might say a binary condition on that we're either male or female and that's kind of how God created us and so that's the lens that we can we can take a look at this from um, and we, if we say that's on one end of the book end of the spectrum on the other end of the spectrum we might say that there's a diversity lens that we can look at too so the diversity lens kind of celebrates the the variation of God's creation in that there's there's in in, uh, in, in gender um, dysphoria, it wouldn't even be really called that. It's just a, 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 a shift in how one sees themselves in their in their gender, in their maleness or femaleness. That's to be celebrated. There's that's part of God's variance in creation. Um, and then, and somewhere in the middle, there's another lens that we could look at this from. And and I think Gary, you call that the anomaly lens, right? Yeah, I prefer to use that word. Yeah. Uh, I, I, some people might also use the word the uh, disability lens. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The idea there is that there is something that's normative, like maleness and femaleness. Which would be kind of the binary, or the, the, the first, the uh -huh. integrity lens. The right, integrity right, lens. Right. But not everything neatly fits in okay. to that way of understanding. And so the anomaly lens would say there are things that happen that are exceptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is very easily the case if you just look at it strictly from science, but I think it's also easily understood from a theological perspective. Uh, from the science perspective, I remember uh, in uh, my first year in my clinical internship at Bellevue Hospital, the very first case that was assigned to me was an intersex case, 
And hmm. so this person was born fully with both male and female genitals. Okay. So this wasn't even a difference between my biology and my psychology. This was a difference within my right. own biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, So we would say, okay, that's, that's not normal development. Right. Mm -hmm. That's abnormal development, mm -hmm. but it's real. It's a real person. This is true. This is a real human being. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not a freak. Right. Mm -hmm. See, it's a real person created in God's image, but not normally created mm -hmm. in God's image. See, so we need to be able to have a lens, a grid for that. Now, theologically speaking, uh, I think it's important to say that the Bible, from my understanding, makes a clear case for personal sin choices and consequences that come from personal sin choices. But theologically, it also makes a strong case that not all negative consequences are a result of personal sin choices. Okay. And in other words, the whole world groans under sin. Mm -hmm. Things don't operate as they normally would operate. Things break down. Things go in mm -hmm. abnormal ways. Right. So not everything is a result of my own personal choices. Right. Yeah. You know, when I first heard those lenses, uh, those different types of definitions, that helped me a great deal in terms of being able to navigate the discussion. Because I, I, for me personally, in, in the world of, of pastoring and trying to care for people, um, and not even with just this issue, but in general, I think that middle lens there um, gives me a lot of space to be able to know how to enter into and, and have connection with people. So um, may, maybe talk about in your experience, um, as you've seen the discussion play out and how the research, you know, the, the academic community discusses it, how that lens um, creates a space for a different level of discussion that we can have. Yes. We well, you know I'm, I'm very much uh, committed to a good solid theology, uh, but I'm also committed to good science. Now, the interesting thing is that truth claims from theology and truth claims from science are sometimes in conflict with one another. Right. See? Um, and so when that conflict happens, depending on which camp you're in when you're entertaining that conflict, it's easy to make a decision of what the source of the conflict is from, and usually it's the other guys. Right. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. right. So the important distinction that really helps me a lot is, is to understand that all truth is truth, but not all truth claims are true. Mm -hmm. And that could be from the world of science, but it also could be from the world of theology. Okay. See? And so it requires a very humble approach mm -hmm. and a very teachable approach when we bump into these conflicts of truth claims. Yeah. See? Uh, and so I think just as a very general guideline, that's a, that's a good first starting point. Right. <laughs> Sure. To work with. Yeah, and you knew you were, you were mentioning, Lee, like when you first um, came across these kind of lenses and thinking how, how helpful that was yeah, for you. Yeah. And that's, that's been a recent thing for me, mm -hmm. just in actually in preparation for this conversation and yeah. doing some reading. And, um, and it seems to me, and I think that Dr. Yarhouse talks about this, like when you're in that first lens, when it's, all, when it's the integrity lens, what, what that calls from me is, is like, then if that's my lens and what's needed then is this like courage for me to make sort of a moral stand, you yeah. know, to go yes. back, you know, yeah. like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the second lens, if it's an anomaly lens, then, then what's needed for me is compassion mm -hmm. and maybe room and space and time for people to walk, walk this journey. Mm -hmm. um, on the, on the diversity lens, mm -hmm. what's needed for me is celebration and tolerance and full acceptance. You mm -hmm. know, if this is, you know, so understanding a little bit, well, there's, there's people coming from different perspectives yeah. um, and good people disagree mm -hmm. uh, on some yeah. of these things. And there's, and there's some merit to, you know, a, a, across the board, um, but sort of understanding maybe my own perspective and mm -hmm. kind of being able to diagnose that, like, this is how I'm approaching this. And also understanding how other people might be doing that could, it seems like that could just be super helpful because it seems like a lot yeah. of times the conversation is just. Yeah, you know, we're coming from different places. You mentioned how helpful it is for you has been for you from a counseling. Kind of describe what yeah. that means for you. How is that helpful? And how how is that helpful for us as a church? Yeah, well, I can say for myself, uh, in engaging a conversation, let's say not even just in counseling, just simply from a, a care perspective, just to be able to engage a person with empathy and compassion. Um, 
that lens right there in the middle allows me to be able to say, I can have my, my lens, and, and I personally take on more of an anomaly lens, and, and that gives me the space to be able to say, you know what, I, I, can, I can put that lens right there, and I can understand that that person I'm talking to might have a very different lens from me. They might have a diversity lens, and they might think very different from me, but that doesn't really matter at that point in time. What matters most for me in that moment is to be able to enter that space and to know how to connect with that person well with empathy and, and, and compassion. And as I walk with them in understanding, mutual understanding, there, there's room for growth. There's room for mutual understanding to happen. Um, and if, yeah, I realized in a very early part uh, of, of my, my counseling, if I, I felt the in, internal incongruence or in, conflict that, that, okay, I have to stick with some form of an integrity lens, uh, otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm not being faithful to, to, to the scriptures, to, to my theology. Um, but when I when I find myself in that place, then then I sense that there's a certain level of fear that if I if I gravitate at all to the diversity lens, that I'm going to fall off the theological cliff, right. right? And I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble. I, I sense that very early on for me that I I had that I had that compelling need to say, well, I have to speak truth into this, otherwise I'm not being faithful to uh, to God and to to what I believe. But with that lens of the anomaly lens, I'm, I'm able to then have the space to say, you know what, I don't need to have that, that, that conversation right now um, because I, I don't have to defend that for myself. I can be able to engage that person with love and care and compassion. Yeah, so. yeah Dr. Barnes, like Lee, you know, he talks about um, kind of free, being free to not see this as a binary choice. You know, it's not just an either or, and you just, you know, mm-hmm. articulated that as well. Um, help me again, like, you know, when I, when I look, when I look in scripture, I can see, you know, God created the male and female. Yes. It seems fairly binary. Yes. Um, yes. and as one who, you know, has not struggled with this, it just seems like, golly, this, and, and, and even to hear counselors talk about, well, it's not either or it's like, help me sort of process that a, little, right. bit, a little bit more. Right. So, uh, first of all, I, I do want to say how important and significant the sacredness of a normative model of maleness and femaleness would be, not only to God, but for him to have us view it that way mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And that we should not compromise that. We, we should not try to change that. The, the diversity lens actually does try to change that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See? It, it's it's saying there's not just this the important significant sacredness of maleness and femaleness in terms of mirrors or reflections back to God as image of mm-hmm. God there there's not just maleness that reflects God and there's not just femaleness that reflects God it's both together mm-hmm. okay so but the diversity lens would say no there's all kinds of options in between those two, and they all would be equally meaningful in reflecting back the image of God. Or, or many in the diversity model would say it has nothing to do with God at all because we don't even believe there is mm, God. Right, See? right. So, um, but in the anomaly lens, you're, you're not diminishing the sacredness of, of the theological significance of maleness and femaleness. So, but, but what you're doing is you're saying not everything will naturally fit into that binary position. And, and theologically, I mean, this is also the case, you know. Right. We, we even have uh, examples of there are those who are born eunuchs. Mm-hmm. See, it's, it's not strictly a, a theological binary. Although that's the normative, that right. doesn't represent everything. Mm-hmm. Right. See. And so for us as a Christian community that wants to um, demonstrate Christ's love, demonstrate his grace, um, then the, the rubber kind of meets the road and, and how we do that. Well, yes. You know, mm-hmm. and I think in this conversation, and if you're watching, you know, we're not going to try and solve the public restroom debate. We're not going to, you know, <laughs> right. it's like that is like, you know, there's a lot of people wrestling about how, how does this sort of, how does rubber meet road on right. this? And, yeah. and I'm just going to kind of dart some of those things mm-hmm. because ultimately I think that for, for our purposes in this one conversation, um, for, for our Christian community, I think solving those issues is, is kind of a secondary issue mm-hmm. 
to what is the pri- like l- let's say oh, let me let me back up real quick and and to sort of say I know that you are not speaking for Dallas Seminary you know you're speaking for yourself and right. but just from what you've articulated here is it safe to assume that you adopt that second lens that for me personally lens? that's the lens that guides not just you know consistent with my theology but guides my operational theology yeah, right and and you maybe? as well as well I would say it the same way it, okay it fits in is congruent with what I believe theologically, biblically, um, but operationally, it, it helps me to be able to love well, yeah. um, a necessary part of what we do as a church and as, a, okay. as Christians. So, so if we if if we kind of adopt that kind of lens, we're we're still um, uh, place a high value on what you described as kind of the normative maleness and femaleness mm-hmm. and what God says, but there are anomalies, and that that prompts compassion yes. for me. And yes. and let's talk about what do I how does that look? You know, mm-hmm. like what are the, what are the things that I do after I press, press stop on this podcast? Mm-hmm. Like how do I, what do I do next? How do I approach this? How do I think about this? Maybe with uh, people that I may run into, maybe there's coworkers or, or family members or something like that. How do, um, help me process yeah, that yeah. a little bit. So uh, at the big view, I would say, um, no matter what the issue is, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, I'm always looking for personally how I would grow my awareness, grow my attitude, and also grow my actions that are always going to be God honoring. Okay. okay. On my own, I'm limited in how I'm able to do that. See, so I, those things always need to be growing. More specifically, when it comes to this particular issue, the transgender issue, I kind of have four. The kind of the big four starting points of mm-hmm. what to do okay. that, that could help mm-hmm. uh, in all those areas. And uh, the, the point number one would be for me to release a rigid binary view of maleness and femaleness. Okay. It's, you do that without sacrificing the sacredness of maleness and femaleness. But you're realizing that there are exceptions, there are anomalies, and these are people that are human beings that are created by God, and they need to be loved by us because they're also loved by God. And it hasn't been by choice. And it's not by their personal choice. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So the, the uh, second thing is more of an attitude thing. And that is, you know, because the culture wars are raging, specifically Mm -hmm. in this area right now, it's really important as a Christian community that we adopt the our people Mm -hmm. attitude around this, not those people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Because we're all children of God, okay? And some are even in the family of God. Sure. See? And so we need to really embrace this our people stance Mm -hmm. versus uh, those people stance. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's very much in line with who we strive to be as a church, as a come as you are church and kind of a me too kind of a kind of a church. Um, This this issue um, doesn't doesn't well, it tests it in a a really tangible way, you know, um, but uh, in a also could be in a, in a really beautiful way. You know, one of the things I, I, I'm hearing about that particular point is the diversity lens, the, the compelling thing about that is that it offers acceptance and belonging. Um, it, it sacrifices the, the integrity part of Acceptance uh, and belonging. Of, for, for the transgender community. But in you the can, transgender yes, community. Yes, yes. Gotcha. Because right. it, 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 it speaks to the heart of, of, of what I think uh, the community is looking for, which is a place to belong. Sure. Um, and so in that point, exactly as, as Gary Barnes just said, that to, to, to move from a those people to an our people gives us the posture of saying there's belonging here for, for all of us here because right. we're all in the same boat kind of thing. Right. Because the flip would the flip side would be like those are those people. Well, in the transgender community is like, well, then be part of it. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Be, be right. Right. People. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. So I think as a church, no matter who is in our community, what, what's going on in their life, this is where we want them to be. Sure. Like, and for mm-hmm. anybody, you yeah. know, yes. no matter what yeah. they look like, what you know, what what's going on in their life, whether whether things have, are in their life by choice or not, regardless, we want them here. Yes. Right. And um, everybody is our people. And so I think, yeah, I think that's great. So thank yeah. you for saying that. And then the third would be the 
close follow-up to that, and that is to journey with. See? Okay. So it's not just in word, it's in deed. We walk together. We're all in a journey. Mm -hmm. Your journey might have some distinctives that my journey doesn't have, but we're going to journey with. This is, a, this is a long span in the journey, and you're going to have a community with you in your whole journey without having to say up front what the destination of your journey is going to end up mm. looking like. Yeah. That's key. I think if you could speak a little bit more about that in, in, in how it is intention with the integrity lens, because I think um, part of the, the, the thinking behind the integrity lens is, is the fitting in boxes kind of thing, yes. right? And so, so as you mentioned, there's, uh, there's no destination necessarily in mind with the journey, but in, if we veer a little bit more towards the integrity lens, there is a, there is a destination in mind, right? Yes. Maybe, yes. you know, speak a little bit about that because I think that's a key distinction to make. Right, and it kind of goes back to the second point because um, it, if, if a person's holding, even to the first point, more rigid binary position, mm -hmm. then the tendency is to say, here's the truth about maleness and femaleness, which is the binary truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you will just embrace our truth and conform to our truth, then you can belong yeah. with right. us. Right. And we will journey with you in that way. Right. See? Yeah. Whereas uh, with the anomaly lens, we're, we're saying, okay, we're not only going to release the binary approach, uh, and we're going to consider you our people, but we're going to belong and walk together in the journey whether you ultimately ever right. end up in this binary description of maleness or femaleness or not. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe you will, maybe you won't, mm -hmm. but we'll still journey together. Mm -hmm. right? And I think, I think certainly if you, you know, take this issue beyond transgender and, and you start talking about my issues yeah. or whatever, you know, yeah. I, I yeah. certainly hope that the church would journey with me regardless, yeah. you know, even if my timetable or even if my turns that I, that I take in my life are not yeah. uh, what someone else would, would hope, or even, even not what, what scripture might teach, you know what I mean? That the church is supposed to, to be a, um, um, a little different. I, I love what you're saying that it treats people it seems to treat people as people and not projects. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, cause I think mm -hmm. it, when you have that, that first lens, it's like, we will love you if, or if you can conform to us, you know, sort of changing you right. to either right. Right, treat you as a project right. and then you end up in the spot, then, then we will love you. Um, yeah. That's well, that's a perfect that's setup for the fourth uh, guide. And, <laughs> okay. and that is while we're in the journey, we're all in the same journey to grow our identity in Christ. Mm. Yeah. You know, we may have a lot of different distinctives that we're gonna have to work with as we grow our identity in Christ. But it's not just me being available to you, it's you being available to me in this joint journey of growing our identity in Christ. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I think that honestly, as I hear that, that that really speaks to the DNA of Chase Oaks, and that we're, we're all in the same boat, and, and and so we're in that journey together. And the the moment we start making distinctions uh, about, um, you know, where where that box needs to be or how we get to that that point, I think that's when it makes it more difficult to to be in that boat together, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's um, I just as I'm hearing that, I just love how we can. That, again, gives us some framework to deal with and, and guides our discussion a little bit better. Sure. So. Yeah, and I, I love the the sense that um, I'm going to journey with you or you're going to journey with me, um, but my role is not to fix you and your role is not to fix me right? because mm -hmm. God's fixing us both. Right, yeah. exactly. And right. so, and we're, we have different issues that we're struggling with, but we both are trying to wrestle with uh, my identity being in Christ and not in this thing or whatever, mm -hmm. or whatever my, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we're helping each other embrace what our identity in Christ is and, um, and being friends along the way. And I think that's, it takes the pressure off from me. If I, you know, have a, have a relationship with someone who, who's transgender to feel the the pressure that I need to fix this person or I need mm -hmm. to whatever mm -hmm. that I can, um, I can love this person and journey along journey along with them because i 
I got stuff too, and we um, and Chase Oaks is a safe place for both of us. You know, I think that's that's a beautiful thing. You know, um, something I'd like to add to that. Uh, you know, for me personally, in the in the world of counseling, um, as I mentioned before early, earlier on, when I started counseling, I, there was this internal conflict, and and I remember my supervisor coined the term. It was called Jesus guilt. That there's the, there's a certain level of of when you're hearing um, somebody kind of in that wrestling space and, and you have a moral lens that you look at it from a biblical lens and it's not congruent with where they're wrestling. Um, it, it, again, it just makes it real hard to enter into that space. But as we, you know, as we have this discussion, we have that kind of these, these different frameworks to, to, to think about it through. Um, it'll, it allows me personally when I'm having those discussions to be able to journey with and say, you know what, I'm going to go through the process in say counseling to, helps help um, the process of understanding to facilitate the understanding of self-discovery process and as it happens really what i'm doing is i'm not my agenda isn't to try to fix or to change um, I'm, I'm allowing the space for god to enter into that space as understanding is happening and allowing god to do the transformative work um, that's when the, the the most exciting stuff happens for me in counseling um, but i'll say on, on just on a, on a personal level when i'm thinking outside the, the context of counseling um i'm I'm, I'm thinking about, um, I actually have, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I own a business, so I have a, a, an employee of mine who is, um, who's lesbian, who's partnered with a, a transgender, right, um, partner. And so I'm, I'm trying to navigate that discussion with them. It's not in the context of the church. It's part of the, my general community, my, my relationships. And I think um, throughout that process, I've had a relationship with her for like three years now. And so I think just as, as Gary Bonds has kind of talked through these different lenses and these approaches, it kind of helped inform my, my approach to how and how I build a, 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 a real connection um, with, with this person in a way that is loving and compassionate. Um, and it gives me ample space to be able to talk at deeper levels about my faith and where she is with her faith and her relationship with God and so forth. So it, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it is it's enormously impactful in terms of how um, this al allows us to to be freer to have the space to have these kinds of discussions and build the kind of relationships that that I, I hope that we can have as a church. So. Sure. Do you have any final thoughts? You want well, you to know, uh, I, I do think uh, a thing that's a really significant anchor point if we're going to be Christians who are really following Jesus is to think about Jesus and right. mm. and so. You know what, what? What's the most you know unique thing to Jesus is he is not only fully man and fully God, but he's also full of grace and full of truth. Mm -hmm. And he was never one at the compromise of the other. Yeah. Right. See, so we're not fully God as well as fully human. So that's mm -hmm. a tricky balance for us. <laughs> right. See, but still he gives us the model that we don't. You know, we, we don't just do one at the cost of the other. Yeah. And so some of us might tend to be more the truth people and who cares about grace. And some of us might be more the grace people and, well, whatever happens, the truth. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. so, but we, we are called as broken people in a broken world to live in the tension of both mm. together. That's really good. Truth I like grace. that. Yeah. The other thing that really strikes me is, is Paul gives us a directive as followers of Jesus. And he says, receive others as you have been received by Christ. Mm -hmm. Romans 15, 7. Mm -hmm. Now that is powerful mm -hmm. to think about. Because how did Jesus receive me? Yeah. He didn't wait for me to get like him to move towards me and connect with me. But I'm a pretty good guy. <laughs> but it took a great yeah. cost. <laughs> it took a great cost for him to move towards you and to me. A higher cost. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how good yeah, you were. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And, and that's how we are directed to receive others. Right. Mm -hmm as we were received by Christ. I really like that because you've just, even in that phrase, kind of summed up those lenses, right? On, on There's a truth lens, right? Yeah. Uh, and the integrity lens, and then there's a grace and the diversity. And if you veer too far one way, you sacrifice the other. Yes. And that, that in my, my heart says it's that that's just not Christ, right? And so, and so in that in that space, in the, the anomaly lens, if we just mm -hmm. use that term, but it really is that space and tension. Yeah. And I think that's probably the most unnerving and uncomfortable thing for it's us as, as a Christian yeah. Yeah. and as a church to live in that. Because we like the, the, the safety of these two <laughs> right. places, right? Boxes if you, are convenient. A, absolutely, yeah. right? And, and so I, I think it's, it's part of our responsibility as every, every generation of, of the church to live in that tension. Because that's, as you said, I love the way you put that. That's exactly how 
Christ engaged us in entered into a world of, of man and culture and entered into that tension with, mm-hmm. with perfect balance of grace and truth. Um, and so in that way, if we live in that world, if we live in that lens, it requires us to lean on Christ um, every day and living in grace. Yeah. yeah to be able to do that. So, yeah. Well, guys, I just, I really appreciate uh, both of you taking the time to, to join in this conversation. And uh, hopefully this is helpful to, yeah. to some degree. You know, I, I think that my head is probably spinning with more questions now than it was even at the beginning, but that's probably to, uh, to be expected. Um, but you know, our goal is to, uh, to love people well, to represent Christ in this world well, to, uh, represent Christ to individuals, not just like people groups, but to individuals that, that are, that are real people. And, um, and I just appreciate you guys helping, helping me, helping us as a church sort of think through these issues and, um, thanks for joining us and, uh, until next time. Oh, wait, one more thing. You're holding a book. Oh yeah. Um, if you want to do some more reading, uh, and you want to just kind of dive into this, uh, Dr. Uh, Yarhouse, Dr. Mark Yarhouse has been mentioned already, but under, uh, understanding gender dysphoria by, by Dr. Yarhouse would be a great place, uh, to start and to, uh, and to really get some some of the best current thinking uh, Mm -hmm. about this. So uh, recommend Dr. Yarhouse's book. Um, Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.